good evening everybody uh, so today's topic of discussion is going to be on vaccinology vaccinology from ijpp i will be discussing 2020 two topics i will be discussing one is on scheduling of vaccines and the other one is cold storage the reason for me to select these two topics are basically because they are dry they are not you know taught in a regular day to day post graduate curriculum so if something is asked you need to know and if you have to manage a vaccination center then you need to know these things so let's get on to the topic so ijpp 2020 vaccinology the first topic that i am discussing is uh, science and practice of vaccine scheduling this can be asked as a short five marks or a 10 marks question per se so if a question on general vaccination is asked suppose they ask uh, scheduling of vaccine suppose they ask cold storage suppose they ask um, uh, what else immunology of vaccination so a general question on vaccinology is asked start with this introduction vaccine is one of the most successful and effective health preventions or health interventions of all time okay in the history of uh, human race so that will be your first line. For vaccine scheduling, you can say there are three key pillars that are important for achieving this important uh, or pulling this important intervention to uh, fruitfulness. So what are those three key pillars? One is you need to have a good vaccine. Two, you need to schedule the vaccine appropriately. And three, you need to make sure that it reaches the masses for whom it is going to be effective. Right? So three things for a good vaccination program to work good vaccines good scheduling and good coverage so three things here what we are going to discuss is only the immunization schedule so immunization schedule what is immunization schedule immunization schedule depicts the optimal timing of administration of vaccine so right side uh, the fifth page right side you will have the uh, definition of immunization schedule under the topic so immunization schedule depicts the optimal timing of administration of one or more vaccines so what are the factors that determines the scheduling of vaccine there are five factors basically so one is immunological factors second one is epidemiological factor third one is programmatic factors these three are very very important apart from that there are two more one is synergizing between various factors and purpose of immunization at the end of the day. So these are the five things. So let us see about this one by one. You can also take notes if you do not want to go through the um, article per se. But the content is the same. If you put it in a um, you know flowchart format, something like this, I hope you are able to see. right? So it will be easier for you. I will take a snapshot and send it to, you, to our Telegram group things that determines a good vaccination program efficacious vaccine scheduling of vaccine and good coverage in scheduling of vaccine immunology immunological factors epidemiological factors programmatic factors then synergistic factors and the ultimate effector or the um, beneficiary whether it's the individual or the community so this determines the scheduling of vaccine so immunological factor immunological factor is what how effective is the vaccine at the end of the day so to determine that, you need to know at what age, if you give, the vaccine is going to be effective, right? So in age, there are two points. So one point is if a polysaccharide vaccine has to be given, it has to be given after two years of age. Why is that? If you're going to give less than two years of age, then it is not going to elicit the appropriate immune response. Why is that? Because the marginal zone of spleen is not well developed. Why is that? Because it's just development. And if that is not there, then the polysaccharide vaccine is not going to elicit an immune response. Polysaccharide antigens do not elicit an immune response if it is not taken through the marginal zone of spleen. That's why polysaccharide vaccine should be scheduled after two years. If you want to give polysaccharide vaccines below two years, you need to combine it with some sort of a protein molecule. So that's the concept of conjugate vaccines. Conjugate vaccines is below two years. Okay, So that's one point for age. The other point for age is um, maternal antibody. So till what age the maternal antibody can affect the vaccine? Again, it depends on the vaccine variety. See, uh, not all vaccines are getting affected. If it's a T-cell dependent vaccine, 
like a bcg then the maternal antibodies are going to have no effect over the uh, bcg vaccine correct suppose uh, you are going to give um, uh, say opv or rotavirus then maternal antibody has got uh, no relation to the effect of the vaccine on the baby correct on the other hand the inhibitory effect of the maternal antibodies is more market for live attenuated um, viral vaccines because it will be neutralized by the maternal antibodies so that is why you need to balance so mmr that is why it's not given very early it is given later and it's not the ideal timing for a mmr vaccine might be 12 months but in india where the effect of measles Uh, disease per se will be more um, and children the it's going to be more worrisome for a younger age you try to give it earlier and add it on with a booster around uh, 15 months whereas in developed countries where this younger age measles is not a problem their schedule is at one year so measles vaccination will be given at one year whereas in india you give it at nine months suppose there's a measles outbreak then you do not wait for the 9 month point to give the measles vaccination you give it even as early as 6 months all right but you do not count count that vaccine as part of the schedule you give it again at 9 months and 15 months got my point so it depends on the type of vaccine so immunological factors two one is age of the child and two is number of doses or spacing of the vaccine in age you have two factors so whether the maternal antibody is going to affect or not and to the age of the child in and um, children in relation to your polysaccharide and con- protein or conjugate vaccine so coming to number of doses and spacing so number of doses and spacing again three points are there here the type of vaccine the age of the recipient and three is spacing so what do you mean by type of vaccine the what determines the number of dosing of the vaccine so see it depends on whether it's a inactivated vaccine or an activated vaccine or live attenuated vaccine abhi chalunga so inactivated vaccine uh, just a single dose will not give the protective antibody titers see if you are looking at papers that are talking about vaccination how effective it is it's not just enough for us to know this vaccine is eliciting a immune response this vaccine is giving rights uh, giving rise to antibody titers the antibody can be there but is it protective enough that's more important so it's not enough to say ha huh, i gave this x vaccine and it has resulted in a very good antibody titers that's not enough for us to know for us it's important for us to know whether the antibody is actually effective against the um, antigen or the organism that you are trying to protect so the protective antibody titer is what is important so i will talk about this later now is not the time to discuss all this but just remember that point of interest so inactivated vaccines do not um, give a protective antibody response uh, and it does not give a long lasting response because it does not induce memory responses okay so multiple doses will need to be given in order to uh, give a primary immunity whereas live attenuated vaccines on the other hand it's going to go inside and proliferate resulting in continuous immune response it also induces memory cells so that it gives a boosting response so inactivated and live attenuated there are some vaccines live attenuated vaccines that can have a primary vaccine failure right the classical example that we discussed when we were doing the um, iap update is varicella vaccine I hope you remember that all right so measles and varicella so small percentage of babies fail to zero convert after the first dose so this is called as primary vaccine failure so in that case a second dose is recommended another situation might arise where they have a good protective antibody titers but the titers wane over time resulting in scheduling of boosters at a later age the other situation that may arise is it gives a good antibody response provided it is taken up if the take up does not happen then there is no antibody response that is happening so classical example is opv resulting in multiple doses of opv so these are the points important for the number of doses and scheduling of uh, the um, gap so one is type so type these many points you are supposed to write 
depends on live vaccine or inactivated vaccine depends on whether the protection is going to be uh, long standing protection or a waning protection whether there will be primary vaccine failure or whether there will be decreased uptake next age of the recipient and number of doses so if you remember your pneumococcal vaccine if you remember your haemophilus influenza vaccination what do you think as the age advances you see that the number of doses of vaccine that is required comes down right after 5 years you don't give it all to them right because by then they would have developed natural infection and natural antibodies so that's the importance of age and number of doses of vaccination then spacing between the two doses spacing between the two doses example will be your ipv where if you are giving the uh, ipv vaccine at 6 weeks if you are starting it at 6 weeks then three doses will need to be given at four weeks intervals suppose you are starting it late at 8 weeks then you need to give just two doses at 8 weeks intervals so the point of starting of the vaccine also is important so the interval between doses will affect the total number of doses or the total number of doses will affect the interval between doses depending upon when you start you can look at it either way okay and another thing you have to remember is any um two vaccines that you are giving especially live vaccines you need to have a space of four weeks two live vaccines four weeks gap should be present remember that and always always you if you are giving us a say, primary series followed by a booster dose then between the last dose of the primary series and the booster dose it should be minimum 4 months the gap should be minimum 4 months why is that 4 months this 4 months is important for maturation of the memory response only if this maturation happens when you give a booster dose then there will be a you know very good boost of antibody titers that happen so this is important in uh, spacing some other special circumstances that might arise during spacing is if the patient is on immunosuppressive agents if the patient is on now receiving uh, iv ig iv immunoglobulin so iv immunoglobulin it's important only with, reg- with regards to mmr and uh, varicella so suppose patient has received mmr and varicella vaccine weeks gap before you give iv ig suppose patient has received iv ig you want this iv ig to be out of the system and then give mmr and varicella so that will be approximately 3 months there are uh, vaccines that are not affected live vaccines which are not affected like oral typhoid vaccine your live attenuated influenza vaccine and inactivated vaccines has got no relation to iv ig it can be given before together or after all right so ivig mmr and varicella remember that point immunosuppressive medication it depends on the immunosuppressive medication so that's a short notes in itself steroids and vaccination or immunosuppression and vaccination etc so till now we have discussed only the immunological factor that is responsible for scheduling of vaccine let's go through that fast immunological factor is two things one is age and the other one is the number of doses or spacing in age you have what age it is and whether maternal antibody is affecting it what age la what you will write less than 2 years no polysaccharide only conjugate above 2 years